Olá, aprendizes da vida, bem-vindos a mais um Injeção na Testa, hoje com a lenda do metal, Metal Legend, Dino Casares. How's it going, man? It's good, good to see you. It's so nice to have you here. You're gonna have a well, very... It's nice to have you here in Los Angeles. Yeah. <laughs> hoje estamos em Los Angeles para ter uma excelente conversa com ele. Fica aí que você vai ver que legal que vai ser isso aqui. All right, so Dino, you've been a legend for a while. I mean, you've been influencing people. You're always bringing out a new ideas, new bands, and always present, you know, always finding ways to reinvent yourselves. Obviously, it's something admirable. It's nice to see, uh, I come from Brazil as a Latin person, and I find it some, affinity right of course you're american but uh i think the latin people they have this guts for fighting for what they want for what they love passion how do you see it i believe that you know because uh you know for me it was always like the the way i was brought up you know what i mean uh nothing was ever handed to me so i think within our culture You know, over for many, many, many years, I feel that we're always uh, passionate because we're always fighting for something that something that we don't have. You know what I mean? So for me, the passion was always music, and I was like, I always wanted to express myself, and I always the best way to do it was for me was to play guitar. How so, was it to learn? Um, easy. Yeah. For some reason, it came easy. My father was a famous um, baseball player in Mexico. Okay. So, uh, when he retired, he bought a ranch in California. Okay, nice. And then I was born. Okay. But he also liked mariachi music. Well, okay, was he a player? I mean, did he play music? It's almost like polka a little bit. Yeah, know? yeah, no, no, yeah, it's fun. And uh, yeah, he played a little bit. He wrote songs. He put out, you know, his underground CDs. Nothing really big, and you know, but he was trying. That's what he. That's what he did. And so there was always a guitar around. So uh, at nine years old, I picked up a guitar and I, you know, I tried. It. Then one day I saw ACDC on TV. I saw Angus Young play. I'm like, that's what I want to do. Yeah. I want an electric guitar. Blah, that's blah, blah. the mariachi I'm following. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, my dad also trained us to be baseball players. Okay. So we were baseball players first. But my passion, as I discovered more music. You know, obviously ACDC and Black Sabbath and then Van Halen and then, you know, it gets heavier and heavier and heavier. Iron Maidens and Judas Priest and Scorpions and then then the Metallicas and the Slayers. It gets heavier and heavier and heavier. And so um, when I first started playing the acoustic, I was just trying to play ACDC riffs, you know, or, okay. you know, yeah. on, a, on an acoustic guitar. And then... I really want an electric guitar, and it wasn't until like I was 14 years old that my mother got me an electric guitar. All right. By then, what were like the main influences? You know, what was hitting on you? Well, like I was saying, like you know, the easier stuff because I was I needed to learn. You know, I couldn't really learn Van Halen solos, nothing that stuff. You know, it's too advanced for me, so I stuck with the easy stuff at first. Okay. You know, AC, right on electric. Yeah, AC, yeah, right on electric, like ECDC, and of course, Black Sabbath, and. Cool. You know, down, 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 down. Easy stuff. Da, 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 da. You know, easy stuff for me to get into. And then, obviously, you get better and better and better. And I was able to learn, you know, Van Halen. And then, you know, Motley Crue. And then, of course, then Metallica. Then you learn the downstrokes. Then down you learn the, you learned the It was Slayer, you know, the speed metal picking, you know what I mean? So yeah. that's pretty much how I learned, was just listening to records, being in my bedroom, trying to copy all those records and copy all those players. And Back then, it was much harder to, to find information about to play with Distortion, and for me at least. Yeah, there, well, there was no YouTube, nothing like that, P people showing off gear, blah, blah. Video all lessons. Can, yeah, nothing like that. You'd have to order the, a VHS Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? 
learn the metal licks and the guy with a VHS. And <laughs> you could see it in the back of a magazine or something, you know. That's pretty much how I learned. And I just, um, I didn't even, I didn't even know what kind of amps to buy. I had a distortion pedal and like a, a bass amp. Okay. Because I didn't even know it was. A, did it work? And did it, work it worked. Out? It was. A, it was a little bit more. You know, too much low end, but it still okay, works. Okay, Until I figured out that that wasn't really a guitar. Yeah, I mean, for, back then in Brazil, it was even worse, I think, because the, the access to a pedal or to an amp was. So I was playing through a homemade pedal that a friend made uh, through the stereo, like the whole, the family stereo. I've, I've done that in too. The living yes. room, in the I've done that room. before too. Yeah, yeah. You know, because where I grew up, it's. Uh, it was three and a half hours away from Los Angeles. And then um, when I was 17, graduated high school, <clears throat> bought a Greyhound bus ticket with my guitar in my bag, came to L.A. All right. Yeah. Did you have where to stay? Well, my sister was going to college here. Okay. She had an apartment, so I slept in the living room. Uh, within like three weeks, I had a job. And then... One of the first musicians I meet was Dave Mustaine. Come on. So I was 18 years old, so I met Dave Mustaine. I'm like, wow. And I knew who he was because the magazines and Metallica and blah, blah, blah. So I knew who he was, and I knew he was out of Metallica, and he was starting Megadeth. Okay. And so I was like, wow. And so I helped him. I said, I'll give you free food. I'll give you free beer, blah, blah. He's like, okay, thank you. Cool. What and was so the circumstance? Was he... Were you working? Or you on the I was working at a sandwich place making sandwiches. Okay. But we also had beer. Okay, cool. Right? Nice place. Yeah, yeah nice place. <laughs> well, yeah, I guess you could say it was nice. it's, it's called Togo's. It was not, it was okay, so. just, it's like Subway. Okay. But we had beer and we had a TV so you could watch sports. Oh, wow, right? okay, nice. So people came in and Dave and walked in and I, it was at night. I was working at night. And, um, I offered him free food and free beer. And he said, thank you. So I went to go ask him a lot of questions. I figured, hey, you know, I give him free food, free beer. Maybe you can tell me how to make a band or tell me where I can find a band or just anything, right? And so I asked him a lot of questions and he was nice enough to answer everything. And then he started coming in like maybe two times a week. And I always had a conversation. I, was, I asked him a lot of questions all the time. So he was kind of like the first guy that really gave me a sense of direction. Cool. Because I was just fresh off the boat, as they call it. Fresh, first time in LA. A month later, I meet Dave Mustaine. Nice. And then basically he was telling me network. You know, first of all, okay. he was like, how good are you at guitar? Okay, can you play Megadeth songs? Can you play Metallica? I was like, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm good enough to play those songs. And he goes, okay, well, the best thing to do is go to clubs, go meet people, try to meet people who are like-minded, that like metal to you or whatever, want to start a band like you want to start. And blah, blah, blah. And just, and that's what I did. I started going to all the clubs. Right. And I started to meet people. That's very nice. I mean, it was... Uh, and that's how, that's how it started. I already had a, I had a band cool. within a month. Within a year from that, 1988, started a band called Brujeria. Brujeria means black magic in Spanish. Yeah. No. Yeah, yeah. And the concept with that was kind of, it was, I call it border politics. Okay. Politics to happen along the border. For instance, Trump wants to build a wall. Border politics. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right? Drug dealers, you know, make elaborate tunnels and they smuggle people and they smuggle drugs through and in and out the California border, Mexican California border. Border politics. Border politics. Okay. Yeah. So that's what Bermuda okay. was singing about. Border cool. politics. Whether, so it's, you had whether it's about racism. Mm -hmm. Because a lot that's of... Also true. Yes, because, for instance, we had a governor called Governor Pete Wilson of California pass a law called Proposition 87, I think it was, and he said that any Mexican that came across that was illegal, even if you were living here, going to school or anything like that, we're going to throw you out of the country. We're going to go to your house, pull you out of school, pull you out of work, and throw you, you out. Throw you out, yeah. Yes. Okay. That's boring. So, so that's racism, you know... Um, Drug politics, all the drug cartels trying to fight for the border. Yeah, and that is a very strong and coherent concept. Yes. And you always can come up with a strong concept on yeah. your bands and stuff. 
and I believe that's a very important thing. Yeah. Not, uh, this is a channel also for the peeps, the kids who are starting out now. Yeah. And I believe that a strong concept it's is very important because yeah. being a good player or it's it's just the beginning of the thing. Right? Yeah. If you don't have something to express, is um, and I mean the border politics is very well, well, contemporary. Well, that's that's yeah. Well, it never died. It never died. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's still going on from you know the for years and years. Story, and years. story before me and after me. It's going. Yeah. It's going to be there. You know, all the politicians always want to pick on the border as a way to try to get votes. I see. Yeah. I mean, especially here in America or the area of California and Mexico. Texas, all the way down to Texas, Texas Arizona, yeah. Texas. Yeah, all the way down there. So a lot of our lyrics were based off things that happened around the border. Okay. Drug cartels. All right. Um smuggling people people just want to come and work come across politicians and then it changed and then like later on Brujeria kind of changed we went into more Mexican politics um, okay where there was, was a band getting popular a lot very popular probably also. yeah well we were getting popular from the first record because we made a lot of uh, uh, controversy because the album cover had a severed head, a real severed head. All right. Right? I'll a real picture. Of a real picture. Okay, basically what happened was um, there's a magazine called La Alarma. And La Alarma. Means, yeah, it means alarming, right? Yeah. To be alarmed, or whatever. And so in the magazine, it always showed pictures of uh, people getting shot, okay. murdered, you know, killed, car wrecks, dr dr drug deals gone bad. It shows all the pictures of the corner. Okay. They take pictures of the dead bodies and everything. But in the middle, they always had the centerfold of the hot girl. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so we see in these magazine, and on the front it said, Brujaria, really big. And it had these pots of blood that you could see people were stirring the blood. Like, for real? Yeah, drinking it or throwing it on their body. All and right. we found out that... What it was, it was a drug cartel that believed in brujeria, Satanism, black magic. Okay. And they believed by sacrificing white people, or sacrificing people. Okay. Some of them just happened to be white. Um, <laughs> would protect them. Most of them. <laughs> that would protect them from the drug federalities. There was a drug deal gone bad. So they got one of the guys, and they put him on the train tracks, and the train came... And it chopped his head off and his torso. And and the pictures, there was pictures, and we saw that in the magazine. Right. And we say, hey, that'd be great for an album cover. <laughs> so let's contact the magazine. So we contact the magazine. They said, yes, send $250 to Matos Motors Mexico, and we'll send you the pictures. We're like, okay. So we sent him a check, $250. We were like, we're never going to see the pictures. Two weeks later, the pictures came. The real fucking pictures. Like a uh, print. The a real, real print. Yeah, real print of the pictures. So we gave them to the record company, Roadrunner Records. Roadrunner, okay. In New York. We gave them to the record company, like, what the fuck? They go, do you have permission? Yeah. They sent it to us. We have permission. Here's the paperwork. Okay. So they put it on the album cover. So the record company, the record company when they manufactured the CDs, they sent it to a place... To, to make the CDs, right? Yeah. This is in, this is in 1992. Okay. When there were still had big manufacturing plants yeah. that made thousands and thousands of CDs a day. So most of the people who worked there were Latinos. So they saw Brujeria and the head cut off. They're like, oh my God. So they would put the CDs in the boxes and in, in on the outside of the box, they would write a prayer blessing the box. Because they believe this, like, oh my God, this is fucking crazy shit. The Latina ladies that are working there, like, oh my God, this is black magic. Oh my God, oh, Dios mío, Dios mío. Yes. You know what I mean? And then they would write prayers in the box. That's I didn't believe this until the record company said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's one of the boxes. Let me show you. And they had a prayer. And it was like, oh my God. Like, they... That's a very it, nice It started program. to hit them. And we're like, wow. Yeah, yeah, we're yeah. making an impact with these people. And we didn't think how big it was going to get within the Latino community. 
again, the power of a concept. Power because of the had, concept. You guys had the, the idea, seeing the pictures, seeing the magazine, the, the whole thing, and and it was strong, yeah? So then the second record, we went to Raza Odiada, which means hated race. Okay. And it was really bad politics going on in, in California, where Proposition 187, if you're caught on the street, they're going to throw you back and... ICE agents are going to get you and throw you out, right? Ready to throw out you yeah. on the border. Huh? Yes, exactly. But ruthless, you know? Okay. <laughs> so we thought it was racist. So we thought we were the hated race. Razo de right. Hated race. That's what it was called. And it all stopped when there was like a truck that came through the border, a truck full of people in the back. They're driving to the border. They get through. They make it across. And here comes all the sheriffs and the police after these people. They start getting people and blah, blah, blah. Everybody runs. And there's one lady who can't run. They get, they pull her out of the car and they beat her. <laughs> they beat her up like Rodney King. But guess what? She was pregnant. Oh, my God. So obviously the baby died, right? So that stopped for a little bit. It stopped the border politics for a little bit. Okay. Because it was it came out in the news and everything. Yes, the helicopter Shh. filming the whole thing, oh. filming the whole thing, and it was on the news. You can look it up. You can Google it. Cool. It's crazy. And uh, so we said, okay, we're going to sing about this. We're going to sing uh, more about the Mexican people, the struggles of the people who are trying to come across to make a better life for themselves. That record really hit okay. big. That one really hit big. We went to Brazil on that record. And, yeah. You know, it opened the doors for us to go all over Latin America, all over South America, everywhere, because people really, it impacted personally with people, you know, how they felt about all that stuff. Yeah, I think Brujeria brought that, uh, the, the, the pride, the Latin pride. There you go, Latin pride, exactly. So we were the voice. We were the things that, we said the things that people... Couldn't say. Yeah. Wanted to say, but couldn't say. And so that really opened the doors for me to go to other countries. Argentina, Chile, Brazil, obviously Colombia, Venezuela, Uruguay, Peru, you name it. All over, <laughs> all over Mexico, you know what I mean? Yeah. And all over, you know, parts yeah. of Europe as well. And so that was great. But then, but then my other band, Fear Factory... We came out with the second record, D Manufacturer, and that opened the doors for me for every other part of the world. Yeah, I mean, it became yeah. a hit. It became yeah. a huge thing. Yeah. I remember. You know, anywhere between Israel, Indonesia, yeah. China, you know, Australia, New Zealand, um, India, and everywhere else. Again, the power of a concept. Because, I mean, Fear Factory brought up a very nice concept. And influenced many, many, many other brands like corn or, or many other industrial it's funny, metal. It's or, funny or you bring the sound, sound, you know. Yeah, it's funny you bring up corn. It's funny you say that because Ross Robinson produced our first Fear Factory demo okay. in 1990. Oh, I'm sorry, third demo. All right, right, and it and it sounded like an album, but things didn't work out between us and Robbins, Ross as far as production. So we ended up shopping the record ourselves to other record labels, all the record labels. Roadrunner was the record company that picked us up. But Ross Robinson also used the demo to shop to other bands, to get other, ah, band, to get okay. other bands. And okay. so one of them happened to be the band called Corn. Corn. Yeah. So, you know, in Fear Factory, we wanted to, because we were always fans of science fiction movies, All right. And we were always fans of technology, where technology was going to take us into the future. So um, the first album was called Soul of a New Machine, which is the birth of the new machine. Okay. It's the birth of the machine, basically what it is. Um, obviously, with a band like Fear Factory, the meaning behind Fear Factory is anything that causes fear, anything that manufactures fear. Yeah. It could be religion. It could be school. It could be politics. It could be... Technology. So anything that we, 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 we mainly we mainly used technology and religion. All right. And and fear that what we l lyrically sang about. 
cool. Right. And mainly the technology because, you know, we were kind of like considered like a, in, like a metal industrial band. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Maybe one of the first, I mean, the, the term industrial mm -hmm. was created together with, I mean, it came up the first time I heard the yeah. term. Uh, True. Industrial metal was yeah, yeah. with Fear Factory. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, I, I like the bands like Ministry was before that. Okay. But maybe not as metal as we were. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, uh, you know, we I like everything from grindcore to industrial to death metal, speed metal, thrash metal, you name it. Hair metal. I liked it all. <laughs> okay. Anything that had killer guitar, I was into it. Um, but mainly when we started uh, Fear Factory, on the first record, you can hear our influences. Okay. Right? We did have a, a unique style with the vocals being clean and heavy. No one was really doing that at the time. There might have been other bands who maybe used the whole song singing all the way or the whole song singing heavy all the way. But we kind of combined the two okay. and kind of like really, um, you know, I would say perfected. The heavy vocals, the melodic chorus. Okay, cool. Heavy verses, melodic chorus. It was not that usual at the time, right? It was like not two different all. worlds. Yeah? Two different worlds, they're coming together. And so we were kind of like a melting pot on the first record. We put 17 songs on the first record. Too many too many songs and uh, too much, you know, people's attention spans are a lot shorter than that. 17 songs is a lot. Yeah. It's a, you know what I mean? Yeah. That's two records worth. <laughs> you know what I mean? So we put too many songs and then... Um, you know, but Fear Factory was anything that manufactured fear. So that's kind of like what we, the vision that we saw was something more futuristic. We were fans of Terminator, the movie, fans of Blade Runner, and Star Trek, Star Wars, you name it. So anything with those kind of concepts of where the, our future could go, that's what we were singing about. That's very cool. I mean, when I heard the, the, the title of the band, okay, mm -hmm. Fear Factor was... Uh, and it came to my knowledge. I remember fear is a word that it connects, it relates to aggression, to heavy music. And factory, of course, is like obviously I could hear the industrial. But, so it represents very well the music. You know? Yeah. The, 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 the band title represents the music very well. Mm -hmm. And in, and I, I, I'm a person that I agree, I'm always looking for coherence on a concept. I talk a lot to um, different bands in Brazil, younger bands, and I find it hard to, to, to get it from them uh, a concept. What is it about? Let's, yeah. let's make it I, more I, even and stuff. Yeah. I work with other bands too, and I'm like, what is your idea behind this? What is your story behind this? Is there a story? Are you just singing just to sing? I mean, what are you feeling? Is this coming from here? Or is it just coming from maybe something you were influenced by on YouTube? Yeah. I just need to know. And so I always try to make bands to find uh, a reason to sing this song. A reason to write this song, to play this song. Like, what was the reason behind that riff you were playing? Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Some of the, I mean, living in Los Angeles, you know, we would take the bus all the time to our rehearsal. And we, our rehearsal was in basically South Central Los Angeles. Okay. And we lived in Hollywood. So we would take the bus. It was a long ride. And, and we, yeah. And we would see a lot of shit. Mm. People getting shot, you know, people killing themselves, jumping off the building. And we were like, fuck. And that shit was just, oh man, I got to write a riff tomorrow. Gang, 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 gang. Boom, I got a song just because shit that. I seen that made me feel something. Whether it was bad or good, it made me feel something to write a riff. It made me feel something to write about Los Angeles. All right. Our second album, D Manufacture, was basically fear. Uh, sorry, was was Los Angeles falling apart. All right. Because within a matter of a couple of years, we had fire. We had first we had fires burn all the earth. Yeah. No. Then we had floods because. The rain, we had heavy rain, and it loosened all, all the soil, and there was no, no trees to suck up the water. Okay. So okay. Just mudslides. Yeah, mudslides. And then an earthquake. I'm sorry, riots, then an earthquake. <laughs> nice year, yeah. That's demanufacture. Demanufacture is basically to destroy, to take apart. And we saw, we saw Los Angeles falling apart. 
Right. You know, we had the military on the streets. With what the for? guns. What for? Riots. Ah, people for the looting. Riots. Yeah. People looting. Earthquake, the earthquake that we had in 1994, mm -hmm. just before the album, the manufacturer came out, people were looting. You know, the earthquakes, buildings falling apart. People yeah. can get in there and take shit. You know what I mean? It was crazy. And so we just seen it. We seen it uh, basically destruct in front of our eyes. And so we came up with the album title, Demanufacture. That's very nice. Right. Opposite of make to destroy. Okay. Right? Demanufacture. So, yeah. so we saw Los Angeles and that's what we wrote the concept about was our surroundings um, and a little bit of futuristic, futuristic themes and also religion. Questioning religion. Yeah. So religion again. In, yes. Uh, I mean, fear. Well, religion is the fear. Yeah, the, yeah a lot the fear, of the fear, fear yeah. the questioning of you know how could how could Jesus let us all suffer like this? You know things like that. Religion <laughs> is a very constant theme for us, I think. I think. Yes, I agree. I was born uh, Catholic, so yeah. You've been to Brazil quite a while, right? Many times. <laughs> you like it? Love it. Yeah. Sao Paulo is a very busy city. Uh, it's a cool city. Great nightlife there. Yeah. A um, lot of fucking traffic. <laughs> <laughs> What are the memories? I mean, tell me a few memories of, from Brazil. That, that was part of the memories. Um, <laughs> just hanging out with the guys in Sepultura and um, the guys in Crisium taking us out to clubs. You know, Gordo having a special guest on MTV. You know, I love I love all that stuff. Going to Going to the local bar local shitty bar to the most very high fancy bars that's cool you know um i've pretty much been through all of it there in sao paulo so what are you up to now i mean in... well right now i'm working with damien right now and we're working on the new assassino record all right which will be our third record cool so we're working on that um right now we're trying to get passed through some legal issues with Fear Factory to hopefully get a record out or something like that in the near future. But we don't know. Think, there's some things that are beyond our control. Uh, I'll bring a reflection now that I'm bringing to everyone who I'm being speaking to. <clears throat> Is this music more about you or about the people who you're delivering this? Both. 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 Mo both motivates me. You know. Yeah. Uh, fans can definitely motivate me. You know, you can read positive things on the internet. You could run into somebody who's really excited about your band. And it can be like, it can be, and so, you know, some days you can just feel like, I don't want to do shit. I don't want to be in a band. I don't want to do anything. But then you run into somebody who's like, Fuck, I love your band. I've loved your band for 25 years. I wish you would do something. And, like, and then it kind of motivates you to be like, okay, yeah, I'll get back in the studio and start writing some music. And cool. so, There's different things that could actually inspire me to do stuff like that. One is myself. One could be I'm watching television and I see something that really is inspiring to me. And for me to express that, I have to play music. I have to write music cool. and play it and to get it out that's nice. and record it and get it done. You know, that's just, it's, it's a combination of both. Just things that are internally for the love and passion of the music. And, and, and for the passion of the people who appreciate it. Cool. So the, the, the connection, right? With the, the affinity. Mm -hmm. it, uh, clearly, you're a very passionate person about your music, about what you do. Fair. You make your living out of it. Yes. Good. But, but, it's, not just, a, a, but it's just not, not, it's not just a living. Yes, yes, it's a living, but it's also something that I need to get out. All right. That's in me, in my head, in my heart. I need my hands, my head, my hands, and my heart, and I need to get it out. All right. So. It urges. You, yeah. you need to. I mean, it's, it's against your control. Yes. Cool. Yes. It was a very nice conversation, man. Thank really, you. Thanks. I know I probably just rambled on. No, no, don't worry. I mean, it was great. Because uh, kids in Brazil, they need to get that kind of information. Mm -hmm. we're, we're living, in my perspective, We're living in like a bubble that uh, they want to thrive. I mean, they want to express themselves with metal. Mm -hmm. They like, they love metal bands from abroad, from outside.
but still they can they they don't know how to to make it uh, unique with their own reality with their own culture with their own values you know they don't know how to print their identity and so they, they copy most of the time and all this stuff you, you said brings out uh, personality mm -hmm. How you print individuality, individuality yeah. how you printed it on everything you've done mm -hmm. in your life. So, uh, think, honest and truth I, to what you like. I think a lot of my life is documented on music. Well, which is cool. Yeah. So your perspective of stuff, as you said, like the barter politics, and then, yeah. So, you're not like just playing songs, you're also concerned about bringing to the audience a spe specific. Uh, perspective, so they would, you know, also think or or re made some reflection about what you're doing. Thanks, Paul. Thank you yes. very much. Very I appreciate nice. it. So, uh, Diego Casares, é, vocês acabaram de ouvir aqui o depoimento de uma lenda do heavy metal, um cara que atravessou vários momentos aí do heavy metal, da história do heavy metal, sendo uma grande influência aí. É isso aí. Thanks, my friend. Thank you. Know, you. It was touching for me to, oh, to, thanks, to, to witness all that story. Vocês ficam por aqui. Até a próxima. Esse foi mais um Injeção na Testa. Valeu.